The amount that was unloaded into the marshalling area was the equivalent of one day of pre-war aid delivery into Gaza. Off of that, then, do you know how much actually reached the people off Gaza? Who, whose lives were saved? How many? Whose decision was it to, to end or not extend the peer operation? Is that a General Carrillo decision? Is that, is that SECDEF or is that the president? And when was that decision made? To, I'm sorry, to so end? So as we, as we always said, the, the peer is temporary. I'd like to provide an update on the temporary peer or the joint logistics over the shore capability that has been used to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza. On Wednesday, U.S. Central Command personnel attempted to re-anchor the temporary pier to the beach in Gaza to resume humanitarian operations. However, due to technical and weather-related issues, CENTCOM personnel were unable to re-anchor the pier to the shore. The pier, support vessels, and equipment returned to Ashdod and will remain there for now. A re-anchoring date has not yet been set at this time. To date, more than 8,000 metric tons, or nearly 20 million pounds of humanitarian aid, have been delivered from the pier to the marshalling area where it can be collected for, by humanitarian organizations for onward delivery and distribution. As we said when we first announced this, the pier is part of a comprehensive response to the humanitarian situation in Gaza. In addition to enabling the delivery of life-saving aid, implementation of JLOTS has been enabled has enabled the development of Cyprus as a port for inspections and deliveries directly into Gaza. Aid can now be inspected in Cyprus and delivered directly into Gaza through Israel's Ashdod port and crossings in the north. The deployment of this pier has also helped secure Israeli commitment to opening additional crossings into northern Gaza. Since the opening of these crossings, we've seen more trucks moving from Jordan directly into northern Gaza to help allevi alleviate the dire humanitarian conditions. As we announced yesterday, the pier will soon cease operations, with more details on that process and timing available in the coming days. We're very proud of our service members and all those supporting this effort and who have enabled vital humanitarian assistance to get in to, to those in Gaza who need it most. Without a doubt, lives have been saved because of their work and commitment under very challenging conditions. And as hundreds of thousands of people continue to face emergency levels of food insecurity across Gaza, the United States will continue to take all possible action to ensure increased aid flows are sustained at the scale needed to meet the needs on the ground. As we've said from the beginning, DOD will continue to work closely with USAID and others in the Middle East region to support these important efforts. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. I believe we have AP joining us on the phone today, so I'll turn it over to Tar Kopp. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks for doing this. Um, so just on the pier, you said no decision has been made on it, but it sounds like it might just be too much between the sea states and the small amount of aid left to make it uh, make sense to reattach. Is, is that kind of the deliberations that you guys are going through right now? Thanks, Tara, for the question. So certainly, um, sea states environmental factors are going to be um, taken a, into consideration um, when it comes to the re-anchoring. Um, again, as I said at the top, a re-anchoring date has not been set at this time. Um, when and if that does happen, we'd be, of course, uh, certainly to keep you updated on that front. And did you have another one? I do, a couple. Um, so, but is one of the options you're thinking is just at this point, because the weather is going to get worse and you've never really been intending to have it last later in the summer anyway, that this might be the end of the pier. Yeah, Opera. so yeah, appreciate the question. Again, can't predict the weather. Um, it's something that we are assessing uh, day by day. Uh, we know for the next few days, there are gonna be higher sea states that would not allow a re-anchoring to be possible. Um, again, at this time, uh, I just don't have more information to provide on when and if a re-anchoring date um, has been well, or will be possible. If a re-anchoring does happen, of course, as we always do, we would read that out to you. And anything additional? And then I'll come in the room. Just one last. Um, does the Pentagon have any uh, of its own intelligence corroborating that Russia tried to um, assassinate arms makers, Western arms makers who are assisting with the effort in Ukraine. And was this brought up in Austin's call with his counterpart? Uh, thanks, Tar, for the question. In terms of um, any further details on the call, I'm just not going to be able to provide that on at this time. Um, I think what you're referring to is um, 
uh, I've seen some of those reports. Uh, of course, we always, with any of our allies and partners, um, always share intelligence and information, but I just don't have more to add at this time as well. I'll come in the room. Warren. One pure question, and then one question on a call with the Russian counterpart. Uh, whose decision was it to, to end or not extend the peer operation? Is that a General Kirilla decision? Is that is that SECDEF, or is that the president? And when was that decision made? To, I'm sorry, to, to end? end? So as we, as we always said, the, the peer is temporary. Um, a decision, it's not just one person. It is a collective decision that is made. And, of course, a recommendation comes up from the commander all the way up to the secretary. Um, we always said that this peer was temporary. And given the um, sea states, the weather conditions, that we know we're always going to get worse throughout the summer, um, the, the mission of the peer will be concluding at, at some time soon. But I just don't have an exact date for you. And then on the call with the Russian counterpart, with Minister Belusov, mm -hmm. um, this is now two calls in two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. was, this, was this one also initiated by Secretary Austin? And, and it certainly seems like these are more common than they've been over the course of two and a half years of the last two and a half years. Is, is this to be expected to continue? Will there be a more regular pace of, of discussions here between the two? This call was initiated by the Russian Minister of Defense. Um, in terms of future calls, you know, of course, nothing to announce. But as the Secretary has said, and um, what I also mentioned at the top, is that uh, maintaining lines of communication is incredibly important right now. Um, and so if there are future calls, we'd, we'd read those out as well. Was there any specific reason given about Yeah, why? I just don't have any more to provide at this time. Liz. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, President Zelensky has insisted that lifting all restrictions so you, Ukraine can strike military targets within Russia would be a, quote, game changer, and that Ukraine needs to hit those targets and able to win. Um, what's the Pentagon's assessment of that? So I think the president spoke to this um, uh, very directly yesterday at his press conference. Um, our policy hasn't changed. Uh, we do allow those cross-border strikes when Russia is attacking uh, from the other side of the border. And as the war has changed, um, we have changed, our policies have adapted. Um, and you've seen that play out in Kharkiv, and it could expand into other areas. But right now, um, we have not authorized the use of attackums for deep, stri deep strike capabilities within Russia. Um, and I have to remind you, they have other long-range capabilities that are not provided the United States. Um, but in terms of our policy, that has not changed. So, so what's this coming from then? Because throughout the week at the NATO summit, Zelensky was pretty adamant yeah. um, that this is a game changer. Uh, so, so, so is that just not true? Look, of, of, of course, you're going to advocate on behalf of your country. Uh, you know, we don't take any issue with that. Uh, our policy still remains the same. Uh, we believe that Ukraine continues to be successful in the battlefield. With our policy in place, we've been able to see them hold and strengthen their lines around Kharkiv. Um, could our policy, could they be allowed to use it into other areas? Um, we are always adapting. And as the war has changed, um, our policy has changed. Um, but of course, we are always mindful of escalation. And that's something that um, is the reason why we have the policy the way it is. Constantine. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, you mentioned, uh, you sort of said that if the peers are re-anchored mm -hmm. twice, is there a world where the re-anchoring attempts are scrubbed and this is the, you know, the peer has done the last work it, it will do? It really depends on the sea states and the environment. And right now, obviously, I can't predict that. Um, what we are committed to is making sure that every single piece of aid, metric ton of aid that is in Cyprus is moved into Gaza. Um, so whether that be through the port of Ashdod or through the temporary pier, no matter what, the aid that was assembled um, will get to the people who need it most. And can you just speak a little bit more into the uh, about the decision making process in turn to cease operations? Was that because of these challenges with the sea state and the environmental factors? Or was it because aid in in uh, Cyprus is dwindling and nearing, you know, sort of the end of that? Well, I think it's important to remember that we always said this was a temporary operation. It was always going to have an end date. Um, that exact end date, you know, I, I don't have for you right now, but we'll keep you updated on that. Um, I think it's also really important to remember that during the course of um, the time that JLOTS has been operating, you know, we acknowledge that there have been um, – bumps in the road. We have had to take it offline. There have been repairs that needed to be made. But you cannot discount the fact that we were able to get nearly 20 million pounds of aid 
into Gaza um, and for onward distribution. We got it, in, of course, to the marshalling area. Um, that aid is going to save lives. So I think it's important to remember that um, in the context of the temporary peer, uh, one, it was always going to have an end date. Two, we're working on other avenues in, in, in ways with USAID to get aid into Gaza. And then three, of course, um, this was always going to be a temporary uh, method. Um, I will go back to the phones and then happy to come back into the room here. Um, Idris Reuters. Yeah, two quick questions. Um, the White House uh, earlier this week announced some long range fires being moved to Germany, um, sort of, you know, on and off and then eventually being placed there in 2026. Um, what's the message the U.S. is is trying to send with those long range fires in Germany? And secondly, the announcement was made by the White House. Unless I've missed something, the Pentagon has not put anything out on that. Is 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 there a new policy that the White House is going to announce force posture movements, not the Pentagon. If you could give any more details on that. Uh, thanks, Idris. Well, you know, the president uh, was leading the NATO summit uh, this week. Um, he announced it. We, of course, when uh, rotations happen, uh, we do announce that either in a statement or, or uh, you know, reading it out from the podium. Uh, but again, as you mentioned, this is not something that's happening until 2026. Um, so give us a little time here. Um, as, as you also mentioned, these are um, episodic deployments and will help inform planning for ensuring future um, stationing. Um, and we are, you know, in terms of the message that it sends, uh, we are working in close collaboration with the German government and the army to continue to finalize these details. Um, but it is about shoring up support um, within Europe. And that's something that not only you saw with this announcement, but with what the president um, and the secretary in their engagements uh, with NATO, um, with their counterparts at the NATO summit all this week. Um, OK, I'll take another one from the phone here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you very much. And I stand with all the Military Times reporters and Sightline Union reporters laid off today. I understand if you have to take this question. When the president said that U.S. and Chinese military leaders now have direct access, did he mean there's now a, a hotline uh, between U.S. and Chinese leaders or that mill-to-mill uh, -mill communications have reset to a time before uh, Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for the question. I don't have to take that question. I would refer you to the White House to speak more to the president's comments. Uh, last question, uh, Jeff Selden, VOA. Sabrina, thanks. The, the UN this week issued a report on Afghanistan, and it indicated Al Qaeda is sending more operatives there and opening new training camps. It also said that ISIS-K has managed to infiltrate some of the Taliban ministries and also push into Central Asia and is even running a special ops force in Iran. How concerned is the Pentagon about Al Qaeda and ISIS-K operations out of Afghanistan? And, and what, if anything, at this point is the Pentagon doing to push back as a second unrelated question, has the Pentagon been impacted at all by the AT&T breach that was disclosed? If so, what is the Pentagon doing to mitigate? Uh, thanks, Jeff, for the question. Um, on the AT&T breach, I'm, I'm not aware of an impact to the department, but of course, this is developing in real time. So um, if there is an impact, we you know, we can let you know on that. Um, when it comes to ISIS-K um, and just the proliferation of the um, you know, ISIS, not just in Afghanistan, but you're seeing also um, throughout Africa, it is something, of course, that remains top of mind for the United States, which is why uh, you have our mission in Iraq and Syria to continue that that fight against ISIS. Uh, it's something that we continue to monitor. Um, and whether it be from AFRICOM or CENTCOM, uh, it's something that we take very seriously. So, of course, we're concerned with, with any proliferation of any uh, plots or plans against um, U.S. service members or our partners and allies around the world. And it's something that we're going to continue to watch. All right, I'll come back in the room here. Uh, yes, and then I'll come over to you, Sai. Yeah. Uh, you said that the surge of aid had saved lives. It's estimated that the amount that was unloaded into the marshalling area was the equivalent of one day of pre-war aid delivery into Gaza. Off of that, then, do you know how much actually reached the people off Gaza, who, whose lives were saved? How many? So for, in terms of, um, so maybe I can explain to you our role in distributing an aid and then what USAID's role and WFP and, and the UN is. So 
what we have done is facilitating the aid getting into the marshalling area in Gaza. Once it gets to the marshalling area, it gets distributed out by WFP or contracted drivers that USAID has been in close coordination with. It goes into dr- distribution centers within Gaza and then gets further distributed out. I don't have a count for you of how many lives have been saved, but what I can tell you is that people are hungry, there are people in need of that food, and we delivered nearly 20 million pounds of food to the people in Gaza. So we are saving lives. I think it's important to remember that. And um, what you saw with our forces is running towards the problem. We created a solution. We believe it was a success. Just one other follow-up. Did, sure. did, did anyone at the Pentagon research summer Mediterranean sea conditions before embarking on this project? There's a sense that you were com- taken but completely by surprise. And in fact, the JLOTS is completely unsuitable for the conditions off the coast of Gaza? So um, we are a planning organization. We have uh, folks all around the world that uh, operate uh, within the Eastern Med at any given time. Of course, we are aware of the sea conditions within the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, We are not shying away from the fact that there have been higher sea states that have um, at times disrupted delivery of aid and have made it harder to get aid in. But again, I would say uh, to you and on, on some of these questions, To do nothing would have been a failure. To be part of a solution, that's success. And that's what you saw with our personnel delivering that aid into Gaza. Well, there's been an inquiry now as to where this $230 million of taxpayer money actually went and whether it was worth it and the decision-making process behind it. I think it was worth uh, feeding people who needed it most. Yeah. All right. Uh, Yeah, Erin, and then I'm coming over here. Just kind of a follow-up. How many days has the PR been functioning, like getting aid off uh, the PR onto land? I believe it's a... Mm-hmm. I believe it was a total of 20 days since it was anchored on um, uh, in, in mid-May. That it's taken food off of the pier and delivered it onto shore, 20 days total. Mm-hmm. Well, two separate things. So the functionality of the pier, it's been operable for a, a, about 20 days. You have to remember that aid started to move when we moved the pier back into Ash, uh, uh, a few weeks ago back to Ashdod. There were those contracted drivers that started moving aid out of the marshalling area into distribution centers because the marshalling area was essentially at capacity. So that was happening while aid was not moving off the pier because there was essentially, um, you know, it was it was pretty full, but it, you know, there wasn't a, a need to necessarily move aid in at a rapid pace. 